By defeating all his rivals, he will get to mate with any female that finds her way here. Golden dart frogs use a particular talent to draw in the females. Singing. For a peacock, it's all about the tail. And a tail this grand needs a lot of looking after. It takes more than an occasional dust bath. The national bird of India spends 50% more time preening than other birds. Not surprising when his clamorous train can reach over five feet long. Having the best tail, in the best condition, with the most eye spots, is the key to success with the ladies. Microscopic structures on the feather's barbs shimmer with spectacular iridescence. Males position themselves in relation to the sun to make sure their feathers look as impressive as possible. If his feathers meet with approval, a male can win a harem of up to five females. But while it's a great courtship strategy, standing out can also attract unwelcome attention from the competition. During mating season, males gather together in an area known as a lek, where they vie for the females. Within the lek, each male has his own small territory. And it's annoying when the neighbors start trespassing on your turf. No self-respecting peacock is going to share. Keeping it clear of intruders can be a full-time job. <laughs> Having successfully defended his patch, now all he needs is the females to turn up. These are the Oyamel fir forests of central Mexico. This unique alpine habitat is a relic from a time when the earth was cooler and wetter. Now, only 2% of the original fir trees remain. Their boughs are heavy, but not with leaves, with millions of monarch butterflies. These individuals belong to a super generation, survivors of an incredible 3,000 mile journey that began in Canada and the Northern United States. They arrived five months ago and have remained motionless through the winter in a state of dormancy. Like a hibernating bear, they require the warmth of spring to awaken. As the sun's first rays strike, there's no time to waste. They take to the skies in the millions, all synchronized to find a mate. For the females, there's no shortage of options. But for a male monarch in Mexico, finding a partner means the ultimate sacrifice. Whether the males succeed or not, it's their last week on Earth. This is a male. <laughs> <laughs> 
easily identified by the two black spots on his wings. He needs to mate, and soon. His luck is in. A female. And she's alone. He whisks her away from the surrounding chaos, then injects her with sperm. He also donates a cocktail of nutrients to assist her in pregnancy and her long journey ahead. He loses up to one third of his body weight in the process. An overzealous male can overdo it and cause a female to explode. Not this time. Now carrying hundreds of fertilized eggs, this female and millions of others like her must embark on the second leg of their epic migration. They'll fly 900 miles back north, through Mexico and into the United States. There, they'll find food and a safe place to lay their eggs, which will give rise to the next generation to continue the journey north. As for the male, his journey ends here. His mate has literally sucked the life out of him. But his great-great-grandchildren will be the next super generation. The ones strong enough to fly 3,000 miles back to these ancient fir trees of Michoacan. In the wet season, the abundance of food allows the kinders to spend more time being social. Grooming is a daily pastime, and Simon is giving Madonna some special attention. <laughs> so I write down any kind of interaction that we see throughout the day. And the reason why we do that is because it can give us an idea of who's interacting with who, um, the kind of relationships they have, most of the time the relationships are between related individuals like brothers and sisters and mothers and infants, uh, they're juveniles. It's interesting to see if these relationships occur every day or how often they occur. Typically in primates, same-sex individuals use grooming to solidify bonds and affirm hierarchies. But here, it's the relationships between the males and females that are proving so fascinating. Anna has been watching Madonna and Simon closely. The males and the females, they form strong, strong bonds. In other baboons, we see females are the most closely bonded. Here we see, actually, the male-female relationships are stronger than the female-female relationships, which is absolutely something I did not think I would discover. In some other baboon species, the male only shows interest in a female when she's in season. But in kinders, the male is attentive year-round and is the initiator and maintainer of the relationship. This behavior is at the heart of what sets the kinders' mating strategy apart. Simon has seven females to attend to, but at the moment, He's focusing on Madonna. With her hormones elevated and the close proximity of the two new males hanging around, Madonna is rarely sitting still. Much to Simon's frustration, As the alpha male, Coram always gets first bite. He's at the top of a strict ranking system. Next to Reed are Coram's henchmen. High-ranked males, these are his closest allies. They help to keep everyone in line.
when the males have had their fill, it's time for the sisterhood. The alpha female and her closest relatives. Her status was inherited from her mother, a bloodline that's been in power for generations. Finally, the youngsters of the sisterhood get their turn. Everyone literally stuffs their faces. Stuffed cheek pouches almost double the size of the face. It's a clever way to gather food while the going's good. And take it away for later. While life at the top is fruitful, it's a very different story for those at the bottom. Anna is the troop's lowest ranked female. She's around 11 years old, has a distinctive red face, and has spent her whole life being last. Her lowly status is an unfortunate inheritance from her mother. There's no jackfruit breakfast for her. Instead, she forages for roots and grubs. She needs all the food she can find because she's heavily pregnant and due any day. It's been a tough five months, but she's doing the best she can. The Valdivian forest is bursting with natural treasures. Many of them are named after the man who first discovered them, including Darwin's stag beetle. This male is about three and a half inches long, but its ferocious mandibles account for more than half its length. From high in the canopy comes the irresistible smell of a female's pheromones, luring him upwards. Along the way, he breaks for a restorative drink of sap. But he can't stop long. Competition is on its way. Another male drawn to the same seductive scent. The rival takes to the air to make his ascent. They're heading for a treetop showdown. But will either of them have energy left for a fight? Sixty feet up, the stage is set for a clash of the titans. Two males square up to fight. The grappling begins. A kind of beetle jujitsu. The goal? To launch one's opponent from the branch and win the right to mate with the female waiting nearby. The climber hooks his longer mandibles under the flyer and triumphs.
The interloper survives the fall, but he's out of the running. Mantis shrimps have earned themselves a reputation for being somewhat ill-tempered. But scientists have discovered that there's another side to these macho males. This young hopeful is trying to catch the eye of a potential mate. He starts by showing off his paddle-like antennae. His technique may not be very impressive to us, but he is in fact sending the female secret signals. And that is possible because mantis shrimps can see and reflect a kind of light that absolutely no other creature in the world that we know of can see. The male's display is a private invitation for this female to dance. So far, so good. She makes her way to the dance floor. If the male can impress the female with his performance, she will choose him to father her offspring. It seems that this male has all the right moves. The final phase of courtship, however, usually takes place out of sight within their burrows. Today, Raja is ready to take it to the next level. He descends to rouse his bride. Hannah exits cautiously. Today, the king is bold and eager. His sudden change in attitude triggers her into a submissive coil. She presents her body to him for inspection. He's picking up all the right signs that she's receptive. While Hannah's ritual is a slinky display Male king cobras are far less subtle. Headbutting his queen is the cue that he's ready to mate. The snakes bind themselves together in a tight embrace. Under their leafy canopy, they may lie like this for hours as he fertilizes her. They will mate several times over the coming days. With the onset of the rainy season, the forest echoes with the music of frogs. More than 200 species call Panama home. A male glass frog calls for a mate. And a female responds. Spurred by the rain, they both come down to the stream to engage in an intimate and ancient ritual. These amphibians spend the dry season in the canopy. But once the rains come, it's time to mate. Before mating, the female glass frog walks around on a leaf collecting water, causing her to swell up and hydrate the eggs inside her. When the female releases the eggs, the male catches them with his hind legs and fertilizes them. 
As the eggs develop over the next two weeks, both males and females play important parental roles. One frog takes a turn hydrating the eggs, while the other helps stand guard. Glass frogs may be transparent, but as parents, they're solid as a rock. To study another more elusive bee of the tropical forest, David uses scent baits with odors of winter green, eucalyptus, and clove. And before long, they appear, orchid bees, in all shapes and colors. In Panama alone, there are more than 50 species of orchid bees. They pollinate exotic fruits like tree tomatoes and vanilla. But these bees have come for a different purpose. Male orchid bees collect scent from the paper with their forelegs and rub it into specially designed pouches in their hind legs. By mixing several fragrances together, each species designs its own distinct perfume. And during mating season, each male selects one particular tree and begins his mating ceremony. He perches on the side of the tree and disperses the perfume from his hind legs. If the conditions are right, he might attract a female. Collecting the odors is a way that a male can say exactly how good he has performed. He can't pretend he did more. He can't pretend he's bigger than he is or he's smarter than he is. He's exactly the worth of the odor he's carrying in his leg. And it's a beautiful system. A female can judge what male really she wants to mate with just on that. And if the perfume isn't good enough, it means the male has to collect some more odors. The baits attract many species, among them the biggest of all orchid bees in Panama, Ulima bombiformis. A good two inches long, these bees are known to pollinate Brazil nuts. After 35 years in the field, David can tell more than 250 species apart simply by looking at them. And the results of his long-term study are surprising. I've been looking at this in three big forest preserves in Panama. Nothing's going down. They're not going down in number. So bees are either not changing or they're getting more numerous. They're not more species, they're just more individuals. They're more of them. So something is happening that favors bees and they're actually either surviving better or getting fed more or reproducing more. But it's an unmistakable trend and I've looked at it for 35 years. I know it's really there. There are over 2,000 species of scorpion. And while only around 20 of them are dangerous to humans, all of them are deadly to other bugs. These Tanzanian red claws, like all scorpions, are mainly nocturnal. Their mating rituals generally take place at night. 
but their bodies fluoresce under ultraviolet light, and that makes it possible for us to watch their most intimate behavior. When a female finds a male, their extraordinary ritual begins. They dance. He arouses her by caressing her mouth parts. But while he tries to stimulate her, she is testing his strength. She yields. Now he is leading her. Eventually, he deposits his sperm on the ground and gently pulls her onto it. He has proved his strength and agility, and she has ensured the best possible father for her young. A male golden dart frog called Romeo. He too is only a couple of inches long, but here, he is a king. He's fought off every other male in a 10-yard radius to claim this best position patch of forest as his own. But the losers stay close, waiting for a chance to take what Romeo has won. Because his crown comes with more than just a territory. By defeating all his rivals, he will get to mate with any female that finds her way here. Golden dart frogs use a particular talent to draw in the females. Singing. Using an air sac like a resonance chamber to amplify the sound, he calls out with a long melodious trill. His loud call intimidates the males hovering on the edge of his territory. More importantly, it carries far beyond the stream and attracts any females who are yet to lay their eggs. A hundred yards away, Julieta hears Romeo's call. She's already on the hunt for a male to fertilize her eggs. Any suitor's call must be strong enough for her to be able to find him in this dense forest. Romeo's song is music to her ears. She can hear him loud and clear, but between them lies a hundred yards of dense and unfamiliar rainforest, strewn with boulders and fallen trees. It's the human equivalent of clambering over 150-foot obstacles for almost three miles. Just finding enough food to fuel this enormous journey will be a huge challenge. But Julieta's biological clock is ticking, so unless she can reach Romeo within just four days, her eggs will be wasted. All at once, groups of tens, or even hundreds within the colony, will begin an elaborate series of movements, all with the goal of attracting a mate. And the flamboyant flamingos have some fancy dance moves. They start with a head flag, stretching their necks and heads high, bill pointing up, and moving their heads from side to side. They then lift their wing in a salute 
to show off their plumage. And finally, the twist preen. Each bird twists its head back and quickly preens. But unlike the macaques of Gibraltar, a flamingo couple will usually mate for life. All the more reason for this single adult female to be picky in choosing her partner. Praying mantises are so named because of their pious looking posture. But these bugs are neither meek nor mild. They're voracious predators. This male mantis climbing up towards his potential mate can have little idea of the danger that he's in. Perhaps put off by the unwelcome advances of the male or simply driven by hunger, the female mantis begins to eat her suitor. Holding his upper body in her left claw, she starts to chew through his thorax. Until the two halves of his body are only held together by a thread of flesh. Eventually, his head drops away. Remarkably, this male isn't entirely dead. He's begun to impregnate her. The female has removed his head and with it the brain cells that control his inhibitions. But his abdomen has its own nerve cells. Cells that control the act of copulation and they allow him to pass on his genes even in the throes of death. In reproductive terms, this male has succeeded, but his death is a symbol of how strangely unfeeling the arthropod world can be.